That was a great selection of songs, and I hope that you feel like it fits into what we'll be studying today. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open them to the words of Jesus, Matthew chapter 5. We'll be reading mainly from the words of our King as He builds us to be more like Him in the way that we love and serve the people that He puts into our lives. Let me begin by reintroducing a phrase that will be recurring all throughout the year. It started late last year. I'm thankful to Ryan Howard leading a song about seeking the lost. And there it was, this idea of missions of mercy. And I've grown to love this phrase very much because each of the two big words says something important. The first word, we are on a mission. I am living life mindfully, intentionally, and directionally. There is work to do. And I trust that everyone staring at me right now understands that that work is more than just be at church on Wednesday nights and don't watch R-rated movies. Like those are some basic commitment ideas, but God has work beyond that. And the work is the people. The work is always the people. You've heard me say it many times that you are a what? Vessel. You are a container, a cup, cracked, broken, and worthless, repaired by Jesus so that you can be filled to the brim with the Holy Spirit. Why? So you can walk around and show how Holy Spirit T you are? No. So that you can pour the gifts and the goodness of the Holy Spirit into the lives of every single person you meet and everywhere that you go. We have a mission, and the mission is bringing the Spirit to all people. And it is a mission of mercy. It is not a mission of judgment where we condemn and then hope that somehow that softens hearts. Our mission is not to take a club around and smack people and they wake up wet in Christ. It won't work. Our mission is one of mercy. It is to connote to people how loved they are by God, how much we love them, and how much God, who already loves them, wants to bless them. This is our lives, folks. And I will talk about this phrase endlessly until this becomes our collective culture. Now, what are one of the things that we're going to need in order for this to work? We are going to need to see people the way Jesus sees people. Until we see people as loved and in need as he does, and in terms of their value to God instead of their value to us, we need to make that change. So one of the lessons that we did some time ago is we looked at the three stories in Luke 15. There are three stories that all make one point, that there is more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than all the saved people and the great songs that they sang this morning. I just wonder, if, like, if we get that. That praising God as 350 people today is awesome, and the Lord is rejoicing to hear it, but He will rejoice more if one person obeys the gospel than everything we provided Him today. I hope we see that. We use three stories to help. Remember, the, the shepherd leaves the 99 to go and get the one, and that represents Jesus. When just one person drifts from Jesus, he goes and gets him. He seeks the lost. He doesn't wait for the lost to return to him. He goes out and he finds them. That's how much Jesus loves people. We looked at the woman who lost one of her 10 coins, and I suggested to you that that woman is the church. And that those coins are the members of Christ's church. And when we lose one, how does it make us feel? Well, we're better off without those folks. Do we even understand the things that we say? We ought to consider ourselves now incomplete because some soul has lost their way and we go like Jesus went and we find them. And then, of course, there's the father who lost the son. And while he let the son go, he was waiting with compassion to receive the son back. We have to love people and seek them like God loves, seeks and receives them. But how do we do it? We did this lesson the week after that. The way that we go and do that is just as important as the fact that we go and do that. And so we saw that Jesus is calling us to ministry and a certain kind of ministry. And we saw it in Matthew 18 in four pieces. One, we've got to be super humble. There is no, I'm up here, you're down there. So start stepping. 
There is, I am on the floor and the Lord has saved me. Come join me in humility and may the Lord save you also. There has to be humility in the way that we approach all people to try and help them. None of us are worthy. Let's make sure people know that. We've got to be careful. Remember the idea of if you cause one of these little ones who believe in me, they may be struggling in their faith, but they believe in me and you cause them to stumble. It would be better for you to be drowned in the depths of the sea than to face me. Jesus said, be careful when you approach people. Approach them with love and concern and humility and strength and truth. But please, and you've heard me say it many times, don't push the sheep off the cliff before I can reach down and grab them. I want you to help bring them back to me. So we want to be useful. I know there are some who look at all this and they say, wow, you know, it's, it's going to take a lot of time and love and commitment and care. Maybe I'll just let somebody else do it. If you're a believer in Christ, you don't have that option. He expects every one of us to be useful, to go to the center and help them, to take two or three of their friends and help them, to get the church involved and help them because we want them to experience mercy. And so we looked at Matthew 18 several times about being merciful just as the Lord is merciful. He's forgiven us, and this is the point of that story, so much we ought to express forgiveness to everyone that we meet. Now, a couple of months maybe or weeks after that, just a few weeks ago, I thought, you know, this looks like some pretty good stuff. Maybe the application is even more than just the person you meet at Walmart. So we did this lesson. Who remembers this? This is from a few weeks ago. If this is really how it's supposed to be, if we're supposed to be loving people like God loves them and we're supposed to be humble, not elevated, but lowly and careful the way that we speak and interact and trying to help them do better, then maybe we should be practicing at home. How's that going for you? Dr. Phil would say, how's that working out for you? Hopefully well. What is the value of saving the world while losing the souls of our family? What does it say if I'm willing to, to give my life to help save someone I just met and not 30 minutes to listen to someone that, that I produced through the family system? So I hope that you took that home and you thought about it because all this begins there and that's where it grows from. But then I got to thinking about this. This is today's study. How far do we push all this stuff? Are there some limits to who is a part of your mission? Is there some limit to the amount of mercy that should, you should be showing? Are there some people that you just can't be humble with? that you can't be careful with, that you can't be useful for, and you can't show mercy to. In other words, what about my enemies? Does God still expect me to go this far, to be this kind, to show this much lowliness to people who would just kick me? If I got down on the floor and said, I want you to know I'm lowly, they would just sure enough put a kick against me. Do I still show it to them? And so I want to talk to you about enemies a little bit. By the way, if you're wondering kind of what an enemy is, I've given you some basic definitions here. It's someone who hates you. Hopefully they're not hated by you. I thought about that a lot this week. My enemies are people who consider me an enemy. I don't consider them an enemy, not necessarily. I think there's some heart issue there, but you understand. People who hate me, people who consider me odious. Does anybody know what odious is? Unpleasant and repulsive. People who are hateful, who are hostile, who are hating, and who just simply oppose everything I do. It's never good enough, and they're always against it. What would God have me do when there are people like that in my life? Now, let me say something about this. I've preached a few sermons on enemies over the years because Jesus talked so much about it, and I've heard sermons preached on enemies, but I have often left the auditorium wondering, like, do I have any? You ever wondered that? Like, enemies in the first century persecuted Christians. They arrested them, they beat them, they murdered them, they hated everything that they stood for, they took their goods. Like, do I even have any enemies? I think that I do. Raise your hand. Nobody volunteering. Okay. But I wanted to try to figure out who my enemies were. So I'm going to share some of that with you today and see if it connects with you. This isn't Chris's enemy, or well, maybe it is, but I think maybe it's yours as well. I made a little list of six things of people who might be my enemy, because until I know who we're dealing with, I can't really apply what Jesus says. And I think that's the mistake on this kind of sermon. You leave here going, love your enemies, and then you don't know who they are and you don't know who to pray for. Uh, let's start with a little category on the left. I'm going to call it, um, I'm going to call it a generic 
category. Number one, my enemies are people who are anti-American. Would you agree with that? Just by virtue of the fact that I am an American, there are people in the world who hate me. They don't know me. They, they've never met me. But if they did, they would have some odious opinion of me and might seek to hurt me. We talk in terms of East and West a lot. There are a great many countries in the East that loathe everyone in the West. There are certain particular countries that do harmful things and have even murdered on purpose people just because they are Americans. Now, I'll say this. I don't know that I've ever met face to face someone who hated me because I was an American. But, you know, that may change. That has changed in times past. I think about the Jewish people. There was a time in the 20th century where they suspected that there were Germans who hated them and then they met them. And things went very, very poorly for them from there. So one category is I may meet people who hate me because of where I was born. What am I going to do about that? And what will I do about that now? Here's another one. And this applies maybe a little bit more to our, our country. This thing just went out. Click it for me, please. Number two is anti-conservatives. All right, now this one's interesting. Anti-conservative is ones who may live in our country and by virtue of the fact that they are way over on the left and they think there shouldn't be any rules and there shouldn't be any of these things that are happening. There shouldn't be anyone who says you can't do that. They hate me just because I'm conservative, because I believe that there's a constitution and we should follow it. Because I believe that some things are right and some things are wrong and they're moral and you don't get to just change it whenever you want to to make it fit you. I've somewhat through social media met a few people who hate me because of my conservative nature, but maybe you will meet them in your future. What would God have you do with someone who hates you because you believe in the Constitution? And then thirdly, anti-Christians. There will be people in this life who hate me just because I believe in Jesus and the teachings of Jesus. We're seeing this now in things like our position on homosexuality or gender roles or gender assignments. I thought it would always be gender roles. Now it's an assignment thing. And Christians say, look, the Bible's really clear. This is how God made us and this is what's right and this is what's wrong. And there are people who will spew hatred against you who will malign you in a variety of ways just because you believe what the Bible says and what Jesus taught. What are you going to do with those people? How are you going to interact with them? What if they verbally or physically attack you? What will your answer be? So this is a generic category of potential enemies. And while I haven't met many of them directly, it could come soon. But now I want to make a list of a more specific kind. This is where I might actually be able to put some names to it. Maybe you can already put a couple of names to this by people that you know. How about this? Number one, misfortune rejoicers. I wish I could tell you that there is no one that I've ever met in my life who does not rejoice at my misfortune, but I don't think I can tell you that. I think there are some people in my life, maybe yours, who like it when bad things happen to you who get a kick out of you falling, probably because of something you said in the past or something that you did or because you're a Christian or a conservative. There are people, I mean, can you like get a grip on this with me, who want bad things to happen to you. About 10 years ago, someone wrote me a letter. A Christian at a church wrote me a letter saying that they wished that I would be drowned and die in the bottom of the sea. They wrote me that letter. I've never met that. I did know that person, but they were anonymous in their letter. That person never came to me and said, you know, I shouldn't have said that. There's a chance that 10 years later, they're still hoping that I die today. Why? I don't know. You'd have to ask them. Enemies are complicated. But are you ready to say, and have you come up with any names yet, of people in your life who genuinely hope that bad things happen to you because of their personal flaws? Let me give you another category. What about character assassins? Have you ever met any of those? They not only hope bad things happen to you, but they talk badly about you. This is gossipers, isn't it? It's people who, who slander you, who put you in the most negative possible light. Look, I say a lot of words up here. How many words do you guys think I say a week? A hundred bazillion? 
They're not all perfectly placed. If you want to take what I say today and put it in its worst possible light and use it to assassinate my character, I will probably give you enough crumbs that you can put together to make a cookie, okay? You know anybody like that? They're always saying the worst thing about you, representing you in the worst possible way. And then the third one to me is, maybe it won't communicate well in a sermon, but this is something that we experience even in the church sometimes, where there are people who look at me and say, you are lost. I say, how can I be lost? I'm, I'm following the Bible and I'm living by faith and I'm doing the best that I can. I'm sorry, Chris, but we have judged you as unsound and unright and lost. And it hurts for Christians to look at me and say, I disagree with you on this point, And I think I have a biblical argument. And I'm going, really, though, seriously, like I'm reading the same verse you are. And I think I'm doing what's right. Not good enough, buddy. You are not saved. And I am. Now there's room to go to someone and say, I think you might not be saved because you're not following what the Bible says. And then go, oh, okay, I need to look at that. But it's an entirely different thing to decide that something I teach or say, something that you teach or say that you're ready to face Jesus with is just not good enough for them. And you know, to me, I would consider that the enemy of enemies. Can you think of any enemy worse than the one who looks at you and your honest attempt at faith and says, you're lost because I said so? You know anybody like any of these people? Maybe, maybe you do. So what are we going to do? What would God have us do with these? Well, let me flash forward to something else here. Go forward two clicks, please. We're going to keep the one on the right, because I think that's where those real names start to settle in. And of course, everybody on the left also fits on the right. If they hate you because you're an American, they're probably going to do these things to you. By the way, I didn't put physical assault up there. So far, I'm 43. I've made it this far without actual physical assault. Maybe I'll preach this in a couple of years or in maybe an hour and change it. Okay, open your Bibles to Matthew 5. Before we get into the points that are on the slide, I want to read Matthew 5. The first thing that Jesus is teaching us is that we need to stay on mission. We're to be on mission and that mission has no limits. There is no one who can be so hateful that they're not our target audience. And our mission is really simple, to connect lost people with God. Our mission is to connect lost people with the Lord. In verse 11, Jesus said, Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, I could stop there. I could say, look, when people treat you bad, just forget about them because you're going to get to go to heaven in the end. And so it's fine. But he actually keeps speaking on this. He said, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand. And it gives light to all, A-L-L, all, everyone who are in the house. Let your light shine before men. Now, where it says men, you could put persecutors. Where it says men, you could put enemies. If you thought up of a couple of names so far today, of people who genuinely want you hurt, it means them. Let your light shine before them in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Our mission is to connect even the vilest offender with the mercies of the Lord. The worse offender they are, the more they need the Lord. Can we all at least agree on that? The more hatred in their heart, the more odious their nature, the more they need Jesus. You're supposed to shine in a way that connects them. Go to Ephesians 2, please. Ephesians 2. If you consider that very difficult to do, if you say, oh, you don't know my family, and I brought up family on purpose because Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10 that your worst enemies might be members of your own household. In that text in Matthew 10, he said, when it comes to being a Christian, your own father or mother or children may turn you in to be put to death because of your faith. Well, what if we got off mission because it just seemed too difficult to do? Ephesians 2 is really important because I get to remind you about 
you. And how important it is that God stayed on mission. Just a quick question, quick little question. If God got off mission, the mission is to connect the sinner to salvation. If God got off mission in your life, how would things work out for you? Because we learn in Ephesians chapter 2 that of all the enemies of the cross that have ever existed, I am one of them, or I was. You were dead, verse 1, in your trespasses and in your sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. That was me. Among them, Paul writes, we too, we did it. We formerly lived in the lusts of the flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Verse four, but God, God's on mission. Being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, loved us. We were enemies. We were vile offenders. He loved us even while we were still enemies. We were dead. In our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ, for by grace you have been saved. What if God was off mission? You know why the world hates you? Because they're off mission. The world thinks that the whole point is to get from people. We understand that the whole point is to get people to God. And in that case, I'm thankful to the Lord. It reminds me of that Matthew 18 about the the section on being merciful where the man was forgiven $7 billion by the Lord and then he strangled the guy over three months wages. He didn't understand how merciful God had been to him. So I would ask you to consider this. Choose the vilest offender, the worst enemy, the most gossipy person that you've ever met or known. And just honestly ask yourself, are they any worse than I was? And if God got off mission and decided not to help me, where would I be? And how will I be with them? Okay, let me give you a few thoughts here on the left side and we'll be done. Open your Bibles with me to Luke or to Matthew chapter five, please. Matthew chapter five. Let's begin with this. Matthew five, two things, love and pray. We got formatting issues too, but not too bad. You can still see it. Love and pray. This is what you knew when you came here. You thought, all right, go ahead and get to it. We know what you're going to say. We need to love your enemies and we need to pray for them. Let's talk about that. Matthew chapter five and verse 43. Listen to Jesus. Same sermon. Same sermon as be the light of the world and help people glorify God. In verse, look with me, 43. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors do that. I mean, anybody can love someone who loves them. If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do that. Therefore, you are to be like God, perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Okay, a couple of thoughts here. One, we already read Ephesians 2. Even when you were an enemy of God, God loved you enough to send his son to save you and to bring you back. But let's make it even more simple than that. Who needs the sunshine in your life? Everybody does. Who does God give the sunlight to? The best people and the worst people. Occasionally, we need it to rain. Rain is important for our world. It rains on the just and the unjust. God's love is not based on people's worthiness. Would you please just like register that somewhere? The showing of God's love is not based on what you deserve. People who are worthy of his love get rain and people who are unworthy of his love, even though no one is worthy of his love. When we start categorizing who gets your kindness and who gets your wrath. We've lost our mission. Our mission is to care, and that's what love means, to care for the souls of every person, to give the sunlight of Christ and the nourishing rain to each and every person wherever they may be found. And if I'm one of those people who can love those who are kind to me and treat those poorly who treat me poorly, how am I different from every other person that walks on this earth? That's his point, isn't it? That anyone can love those who love them, but you need to love all of those who are with you. And verse 44 says you need to pray for them. How do we love our enemies? We pray for those 
who hate us. I pray by written name for the people I know who want bad things to happen to me. I pray by literal first and last name before God, the people who have gossiped about me and who seek to assassinate my character. And I pray for members even of the Lord's church who have drawn lines of fellowship that God gave them no right to draw and have cast me out. I pray for them. Do you? It is so easy to respond with anger or to push aside. But again, God should have done both of those things to you and he did not do it. He should have thrown you away or pushed you aside, but he chose to do what was right. The Bible talks about the prayers of Jesus. What did Jesus do on the cross? Anybody remember his final prayer to God? Forgive these people because they do not understand what they're doing. And it wasn't just Jesus who did that. Do you remember Stephen in Acts 7? In Acts chapter 7, Stephen was being stoned to death. And in his last words, he repeated the words of Jesus. And he said, please don't hold this sin against them. They don't know what they're doing. Pray for your enemies. Let me remind you of the perfect prayer plan. You guys remember this? We did it just recently. And of the 10 things that Jesus did, the first four were about filling the day with prayer. If you follow Jesus' model, and this is the perfect prayer plan because it was Jesus' model. If you follow the perfect prayer plan, you'll be praying in the morning and at meals and at a secret time during the day and at night. What you are praying are very important three things in the middle. Every Christian every day ought to be praying with a thankful heart to God. You ought to be asking God for wisdom. And you ought to be asking God to fix the things in you that are broken. But look at the last thing, number 10. What should you be praying for the people who distrust you, who malign you, or who attack you? Jesus prayed for those who didn't love him, and we should do the same. Anybody know what you should be praying for your enemies? Number five, number six, and number seven. What do I write when I write the name of that person who's not giving me a fair shake? What do I write about that person who no matter what I try to do, it's never good enough for them? What do I write about that person? What are my prayers about that person? I pray that they will have restored within them a heart of thankfulness that has a better appreciation for God's love for them. I pray that my enemy will receive wisdom from God through passages, through providence, or through people. And I pray that the bully in my life, all bullies are broken. Did you know that? Because all people are broken. It's an easy cast. It's easy to prove. But people who treat people unkindly, people who do not have mercy in their hearts, people who have to label everyone else to make themselves feel better, are broken people. So I pray for my enemies that God, will you heal what is broken within them? And will you use me as an instrument to do it. We need to be praying for our enemies in the same way that we pray for ourselves. Go with me to Luke chapter 6, please. Let's add some more things. I'm going to add two more thoughts to our chart. Jesus said when it comes to your enemies, he says to love them. Let's move forward. He says to love them and pray for them and also to give to them. All right, this is about to get tough. It was easy up to this point. Maybe you looked at the clock and thought we were done. This is where it gets a little extra challenging. The Bible says you're supposed to care about them and also pray to them. But listen to me in Luke 6 and what Jesus said, beginning in verse 27. Luke chapter 6, verse 27. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Okay, got it. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Whoever hits you on the cheek, give him your other cheek. Whoever takes away your coat, give him your shirt. Give to everyone who asks of you, and whoever takes away what is yours, do not demand it back. Treat others the same way you want them to treat you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. Now I'm going to pause there a moment. Because I want you to connect the word love and give. You love those who love you, don't you? People love you, you love them. So you would give. If somebody who loved me wanted something, I'd give it to them. 
If somebody who loved me had a need, I would give it to them. When he says, if you love those who love you, what credit is that? Even sinners do that. He's talking about giving in this text. He's saying you would give to those who love you. I want you to give to those who do not love you. Verse 34, if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, that's not giving. What credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners in order to receive back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend. And he says in, in verse 34, in verse 35, do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. You say, well, I probably won't get anything in return. They're an enemy. Well, that's kind of the point. They're your enemy. You're going to do nice things for them and they're not going to do nice things back. How many of you expect that if you do something nice, something nice should be done in return? Like that's just kind of life 101. I went out of my way with an enemy and I said something kind. And so I'm sitting there going, come on. I did this, you did that. If that's the way we do good to people, we don't understand the mercies of the Lord because I'm pretty sure my return on his investment has not been fantastic. I'm pretty sure the extent of love he's sown into me, he's not exactly gotten the crop that he deserves from me, but he gave to me because he loves me and he wants what's good for me. If we're measuring based on return, then we're missing the point. Love your enemies again, verse 35, and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great. God will take care of it. You will be sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. In other words, God is being gracious to them. You be gracious to them. Now, what is Jesus saying? You ever wonder if Jesus says what he means and means what he says? One of the scariest thoughts to me is, what if Jesus actually means the things that he says? What if he's saying, if an enemy attacks you, let him attack you twice. If an enemy steals from you, say, hey, before you go, you know, you missed a few of these things I had hidden under the bed. You want to take them also? What if when Jesus said these things, or in Matthew, if somebody forces you to go a mile, what do you do at the end of the mile? You say, you know, I'm still feeling pretty good. I think I can walk out another one. We've done a lot of explaining away on this passage. We've done a lot, because it, it sounds impossible. We've done a lot of, well, what he means is, it would be better to do that as opposed to cursing or attacking them. That's a true statement, but it's kind of, we just watered it down a lot, didn't we? Because here's what's cool about it. If you water something down enough, you don't have to do anything. Anybody notice that? It's a really cool little skill that we have. If you water it down enough, you don't have to do anything. So he's actually saying, like, give to those who hate you. Lend to those who you know are never going to give it back to you. If they hurt you, just say, you know what? If that makes you feel better, why don't you just hurt me again? If that's what you need to do, you just do it. Like, what, what he means is, he doesn't mean you actually have to do any of that stuff. Well, follow me. He just means make sure you don't do the opposite of that stuff. Folks, he means a little more than that. He means to actually give and offer and lend. You say, well, you got to balance all that with protecting your family and people breaking in. Look, I understand self-defense and family. But I'm not talking today about my enemies or some random guy who doesn't know me is going to try to break into my house. I'm talking about people who do know me and have chosen that they don't believe in me and that they hate me. I want to give to them. I want to lend to them. I want to pray for them. I want to help them. Why do I want to help them? Because they need help. I know they don't know that they need help. I know that my enemy will never ask for help, but I know they need it. And I will give. That is God's will for us in Christ. And then help. It's already there. Help. Or hell. <laughs> Go with me to 1 Peter 3. I want to show you a couple passages here. 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. What does the Bible say about our conduct to others? 1 Peter 3 is about all kinds of different relationships, marriage, some of your own enemies, maybe someone that you're married to at times. That context is here in verses 1 through 7. But what's important to me are these six things in verses 8 and 9, where the goal is to try to be in harmony. 1 Peter 3, 8, and sympathetic and brotherly and kind. But look at verse 9. Not returning evil for evil. So we're not just talking about giving gifts now to be kind. We're talking about, like Jesus said, they've done something unkind to me. Not returning evil for evil. Anyone can do that. Or insult for insult. You talk bad about me, I'll talk bad about you. Anybody can do that. But giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. Return evil 
with kindness, with blessing. Now, what is the result of that? How many of you guys know Romans 12, 20? Let's head over there. You'll recognize it as soon as you see it. Go to Romans chapter 12, verse 20. And this is like that little payoff that we get in our left pocket that we don't talk about. If we are kind to those who are unkind, if we return a blessing instead of a curse, it's really about their good and we're trying to help them out, but it does heap burning coals on their head and I get a tiny bit of satisfaction out of that. Look at Romans chapter 12 and verse 20. If your enemy is hungry, there's your opportunity. Thank God for giving it to you and feed him. If he is thirsty, there's an opportunity. Thank God for giving it to you and give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Doesn't that, that feels good a little bit. This is actually a quote from a proverb, but it doesn't really help because it just says the same thing and it doesn't give it any context. But I have something I want to read for you. I have a little paragraph that I want to read. I want you to note before I read this, this came from a commentary on the book of Romans, really good, and I found it the most insightful comment because I really wanted to know, like, Jesus is setting up this whole love, pray, give, help, and then I just get to, like, dump coals on him in the process? Like, what's the deal with that? I want you to understand that every commentary on this text, every Greek historian and Hebrew historian is going to tell you that it doesn't mean what it looks like it means. There's really no part of this where you get satisfaction in their pain. There's no part of this where you get to actually drop a coal on their head and get a little bit of retaliatory embrace. None of that. But nothing is better than this little paragraph right here. So I'm going to read it to you. What does it mean when you do kind and it's heaping coals on their head? Listen to this. A bold expression which has been variously interpreted, but seemingly without good reason. Listen, the meaning evidently is this. If your enemy be hungry and thirsty, feed him and give him drink. Your good deeds, I like this. This is called optimism, folks. It's a really great thing. You ready? You say this will never help. Listen. Your good deeds will restore him to his right mind and right feelings. They will bring him to himself and enable him to see how undeserved the evil is he has done you. In this restored state, his conscience will give him keen pain. His own evil acts will torture and distress his soul. They will burn in him like fire. The end may be his repentance. Your generous conduct towards him will give you control of his ear. And when once you get control of this, may, you may soon come to control his heart. He is now in your power and with skill you may save him. That is beautiful. You say, well, I don't know. Boy, that sounds good. All of a sudden he's going to feel bad for the way he's been treating me. And then he's actually going to start listening to me a little bit. And then we're going to actually become friends. And then we get to go to heaven together. That's what he was saying there. You say, that's not been my experience. You know, I'll be honest with you guys. It's not always been my experience either. But can I also be honest in saying that I've not always approached it the way Jesus told me to? I found a way to put a barb in even while giving a gift. I have a little sarcasm problem in my life. I'm doing kind, but I'm letting you know this is really about winning. I'm keeping score here. And you're supposed to feel bad about the thing that I'm doing. That's the reason I'm doing it. You see what I just did? I just finally let it go right at the end. You don't think your enemy can pick up on an ill-fated plan that's really about you? You want to win your enemy over to Christ, then pray for them and help them and give to them and do so so that you might restore your relationship with them. Last passage and then we're done. Thank you guys for your attention. Second Timothy chapter two, please. I'm gonna put one more line up here and it's gonna come up just perfect, pretty close to perfect. Be compassionate. This is an important one for me. Jesus didn't hate his enemies. He felt sorry for them. Jesus saw the Jewish people, remember when he came into Jerusalem and he knew they were going to murder him. I mean, you talk about an enemy. They knew that they had they blasphemed against him and they were going to torture him and murder him. And he said, I'm just a, a hen that wishes I could gather the chicks under, under my wing. I just want to protect you. I feel sorry for you, but you will not have it. If you want to win your enemy, your anger has to turn to compassion, your wrath to mercy. It has to be about their lost state, not your own 
position and credibility. 2 Timothy chapter 2, I love this very much. 2 Timothy 2, last thing we'll do. This is about being a vessel. Now in a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but there are vessels of wood and earth and ware and some to honor and some to dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. That's what we've been talking about. Flee youthful lust, pursue righteousness, pursue faith and love and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Avoid or refuse foolishness and ignorant speculation, knowing that all they do is make you fight. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all. Focus on this. This is where we're going. Able to teach, patient when wrong, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition. Watch this. This is what it's about. If perhaps... God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. Why am I being kind to an enemy? Because maybe God will save them. Why am I sharing the truth with someone who's previously rejected it? Because maybe it will lead them to the Lord. That they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. Who are your enemies? Were you able to make a list earlier? You know, the interesting thing about enemies is I have friends and enemies. Okay, over here is like um, Jason. He's my friend. And over here is like, I don't know, Vladimir Putin or somebody. Somebody who just like, hey, he doesn't know me, but he wouldn't like me. But you know, in between your friends and your enemies is a spectrum. Does anybody know about that spectrum? Where there's a lot of suspicion on it. You guys know what I'm talking about? Like, I don't know if this person's my enemy, but I have some reasons to believe that it's enemy-ish. I, I don't know that they all out hate me, but, but somewhere along the way, they're closer to, to hating me than loving me. There are a lot of people in your life on that spectrum headed towards hate. But here's what you need to know about every single one of them. They have been trapped by the devil. They are ensnared, verse 26. They are not able to think clearly, and they are in the bonds of the evil one. They are not evil people. Not at heart, not the way God made them. They are captured by the evil one. And so I hate the devil, but I don't hate the person the devil has captured. I want to free them. I want to help them come to their senses and see that God is good. And one day when the Lord comes back, everybody's senses will be aware. When the Lord comes back, everybody who's ever lived will bow before Him. All of the shackles of the devil will be off or sealed forever. I want to get somebody to see that before Jesus comes. Do you know anyone in your life who needs to be freed from the devil before Jesus comes? They may be an enemy of yours or of the cross. Help them. Help them. Be compassionate and kind and loving. We offer an invitation at this time for anyone who has not become a Christian. Let me just say, if you've not become a Christian, you're an enemy of the cross and he wants to forgive you. The mercies of the Lord are new every morning and you can become a friend of the Lord through baptism. But mainly I understand today the invitation we're offering is for us to have hearts more like God's heart. Not towards your friends. Everybody loves their friends. But to the people whom God is yearning to save. Your enemies. And he's decided to use you to do it. Are you ready for that mission of mercy? It will be hard. But the glory will be to God. Is that good enough for you? That's good enough for me. Come if we can help you as we stand and sing.